We're so glad you're here to listen to this week's sermon from Park Street Church. Park Street is a historic congregation located in the heart of Boston. But more than that, we're a community of people from all different backgrounds who believe and are united by the good news that Jesus is Lord. Visit us at parkstreet.org to learn about our community. Jonathan Edwards, he's remembered as America's greatest theologian, and before he died, he became president of Princeton University. But early on in his, uh, as a young man, in 1729, he became pastor of uh, the Congregational Church in Northampton, Massachusetts. And as he arrived there, he discovered that the state of the souls were, in his words, very degenerate. He talked about the young people who, in their words, the young people participated in frolics, which were night walking. They were frequenting the taverns and lewd and foolish practices. Edwards concluded that the church and the town were full of, in his words, dry bones, which was this form of godliness, but the spirit was not there. These were respectable folk living a powerless orthodoxy. That is, they had right beliefs, they had orderly worship, but they had hard hearts. Richard Lovelace, in what I think is a a very important book, written in 1979, and I think continues to be very relevant. He was a seminary professor at Gordon-Conwell. I had the privilege of having him way back in 1995. He wrote a book called Dynamics of Spiritual Life and Evangelical Theology of Renewal. That book is as important today as it was when he first came out with it. And he talks about the, the cyclical spiritual pattern that takes place both in souls, but specifically among churches. Churches, they begin with some kind of spiritual awakening, but over time they go into decline. And there can be this failure to pass along the faith and the gospel to the next generation, and in that failure there eventually comes an apostasy. It's during that decline where, especially within the churches, a formal, uh, there is a formality of dead religion that takes hold of the people. And Lovelace talks about that either two things happen. Either the gospel gets totally lost, that, that gospel, or there's revival through the gospel. Uh, the gospel, which is the, focused on the centrality of the cross, the the blood of Christ which redeems us, and the righteousness of Christ, not the self-righteousness that dead orthodoxy tends to produce among Christians. Lovelace defines revival as, quote, not a special season of extraordinary religious excitement, but rather an outpouring of the Holy Spirit which restores the people of God to normal spiritual life after a period of corporate declension or decline, unquote. And I think this is the context that the Apostle Paul is writing when we consider the letter to the Ephesian Christians. Paul is not addressing non-Christians, he's addressing Christians who are being wooed by the cultural spirits in verse 16, for the days, he says, are evil. And if you don't have your Bibles open, I encourage you to open your Bibles so you can uh, pay attention to to the text of Ephesians chapter 5. He goes on to uh, describe that it, it, it lulls the Christians into spiritual sleep in chapter 5, verse 14. So he says, to the Christians, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And then Paul comes to the pinnacle, really, of, of this chapter in verse 18, which is Paul's central thesis. And he says, be filled with by the Spirit. By is probably the better translation. Be filled by the Spirit. New Testament scholar Gordon Fee, he argues that this specific imperative, be filled by the Spirit, is not just another uh, imperative and a long list of imperatives, but rather it's the key to the Ephesians, and, and actually Fee argues that this specific 
imperative, imperative is the key to all of Paul's writings. See, the problem that Paul is addressing here is that drunkenness with cultural spirits leads to spiritual drowsiness, which leads to decline, and eventually it leads to dead bones. Dead bones. It's a threat. That path, that cycle, is a threat to every soul, to the church, to the city, and to our nation. And Paul is emphasizing that there really is only one answer to this threat, which is found in verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled by the Spirit. And you can see in verse 18 that there's an, there are two commands. One is in the form of an, a negative, and one is in the form of a positive. We are to, in the negative, we are to be emptied of those intoxicating spirits, and then in the positive, we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'll just structure my thoughts around those two key ideas. So first, we are to be emptied of intoxicating spirits. Verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. In other words, we are to say no to drunkenness. Now, wine in the Bible is itself considered God's covenant blessing. The psalmist in Psalm 104.15, he says, The Lord God brings forth food. The Lord God brings forth wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. So the prohibition in, in the Bible, and specifically, as you can see in Ephesians 5.18, is not against wine used in moderation, but it's against drunkenness. And I think it doesn't take long to figure out that alcohol quickly becomes a, not a covenant blessing, but a curse if overused or if you form any kind of dependence on it. And drunkenness, I think, begins not when you're vomiting or you're lying on your couch unconscious, but as soon as that substance prevents you from exercising full control over your thoughts and your words and your actions. I think it's indeed the case that drunkenness, even one instance, or dependency, or ultimately addiction, they all go against life in the spirit. The Holy Spirit, he opposes drunkenness and that dependency on it and that addiction to substances, and he is the one who truly can set us free. In fact, when my father, when he was in his late 30s, he was a heavy drinker uh, and he, a chain smoker. And he finally came and gave his life to Jesus Christ, and a, the Spirit of God came over him in a remarkable way. And the day that he gave his life to Christ, a miracle took place, and he's now, uh, he just celebrated his 85th birthday, and he has never had another drink, or he's never smoked again. There is a, a mother in our congregation who at the time had two young children. She had a great life, life in the suburbs, uh, but she was dealing with alcoholism and she couldn't get free. Until one day she got into a significant car accident and she hit total bottom. She had tried absolutely every way to get freed from that addiction. But in her words, it was only when she gave her life to Christ, praying to him and asking for that freedom that she discovered God's wonderful and amazing freedom, and she is sitting here right in our midst right now. Praise God for that, and praise God for the work he's done in many people's lives in that way. Amen? Amen. But it's not just literal drunkenness that Paul is addressing. He's also calling us to empty ourselves of the intoxicating spirits that confuse us and ultimately lead us to death. There's, in fact, if you look carefully, there's a, there's a parallelism between being drunk with wine and being filled by the Spirit. It's clearer in the Greek, in the original Greek, but both are imper imperatives, both are in the passive present tense. Uh, both of these ideas of wine and the Spirit are conceptual, conceptualized as liquids, wine literally a liquid, and the Spirit who fills us, which is kind of a liquid verb, and both are in the passive tense, so that when 
either one of those substances, the wine or the spirit, enter into you, they overtake you and they control you. So you can begin to see why he's comparing these two things. But not only so, but then Paul uses this word debauchery. Uh, do not be drunk with wine, which is debauchery. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't even know what debauchery means, and I've never even heard it before, and probably you don't use that word either. But it's important to understand that in the Greek, soteria is the Greek word for salvation. It can be translated as health, as wholeness. Sometimes it's translated as eternal life, or it just means salvation. We're being saved from something. The word debauchery in the Greek is asotia, uh, which basically is the ah, is the negation of salvation. It's, it's anti-salvation is what he's talking about. And I think uh, maybe the best translation for this word is a lost life. So do not be drunk with wine, which is a lost. It leads to this lost life. And the Ephesians, I think, would have understood what Paul was doing here by his comparing the drinking of wine and the spirit because he was alluding to the worship of Dionysus. Dionysus was in Ephesus, or as well in the Greco-Roman world, was the god of song, the god of wine, and the god of sex. And it was Dionysian worship which led to rev revelry, but eventually it, it led to a brokenness within the family and to lost lives. And so Paul is juxtaposing, if you kind of consider what's going on here, he's juxtaposing the Dionysian anti-salvation, that debauchery, with the Holy Spirit salvation. And then if you consider in verses 19 through 21, the Dionysian sort of worship, it leads to lewd songs, which was common, uh, but the worship of the Spirit, and in the Spirit, leads to psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to the Lord, verse 19. One leads to the temporary suppression of problems through the drinking of alcohol. We know that's why many turn to it in the end or get addicted. But the other, the Holy Spirit, it leads to the giving of thanks and thanksgiving. And we know if you follow the path of the Dionysian worship, it leads to broken marriages and broken families. Whereas if you follow the salvation path of the Holy Spirit being filled in him, it leads to, verse 21, mutual submission within the family. So this is part of the reason under, that, that underlies why Paul is emphasizing these things as he's comparing these two forms of worship. Do not be drunk with wine, which is this lost life, actually applies to all of us, even if you don't even drink at all. It actually does apply to you because it, it's, a, it's a metaphor. It's literal, but it's also a metaphor for not allowing yourself to become under the influence of any kind of intoxicating spirit, whether the Dionysian spirit or the many other substances, ideologies, or spiritualities that exist all around us and seek to intoxicate us, confuse us, dominate us, and eventually it will lead indeed to those dead bones. So what about you? Are you under the control of some substance? Is there some ideology that is confusing you and leading you to do things that you should not be doing? Is there some spirituality that's not of the Holy Spirit that needs to be broken? You see, the first step that Paul in his negative prohibition, the first step of being filled with the Spirit is that you have to become empty of these other spirits, these false spirits which fill you up. You can't be filled with the Spirit if you have these other spirits in you, and so it, each one of us needs to confess and to repent of those spirits. And I wonder, do you have something that you need to bring before the Lord in confession? Something that's controlling you, something that you're dependent on, but it's not the Holy Spirit. I'd like to call you, invite you, to bring those things, even now as I'm speaking, to the Lord. So in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit, first we have to empty ourselves of these defiling kinds of spirits. But second, now in the positive, the Apostle Paul says we are to be filled by the Spirit. What does it mean to be filled by the Spirit, and how can we be filled by the Spirit. And I'd like to engage uh, this over those, around those two questions. First, 
What does it mean to be filled by the Holy Spirit? That Holy Spirit who is the third person of the, the one true God. He's co-eternal, co-equal, co-substantial with the Father and with the Son. These three persons who form one being. This Holy Spirit who is given by God as God in the direct and unmediated way in which we have relationship with the living God. So that if you put faith in Christ, it's not that God is up there and we're down here, but God comes down and indwells the believer so that his spirit is intertwined with our spirit. And it's his love penetrates and intertwines with our soul so that we understand and know his love. Now, that was not necessarily the case in the Old Testament in which the, the Spirit could come and go. They did not have yet the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is why in Ezekiel 37, 14, there is this prophetic expectation that I will put my Spirit within you and you shall live. But it becomes fulfilled at Pentecost when Jesus Christ pours out his Holy Spirit upon the church, beginning the church, over the disciples, and we enter into that ministry of the Spirit, of his indwelling, continual presence, when we put our faith in Christ alone and trust in him as our Lord and Savior. His Spirit immediately indwells the believer within your soul. Your soul becomes entwined with his soul, and he will never leave you or forsake you. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16, 16, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells within you? And so this indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, it's this wonderful bond. And it's all about the love, the love of God for us. He doesn't want to be distant and far away. He wants to get close. He wants to get so close that he will entwine his Holy Spirit with us so that we might know him and commune with him in the deepest sort of way. God desires this intimate spiritual bond so that we would be transformed in love by him. Well, there, uh, what does it mean to be baptized by the Holy Spirit? Uh, there have been co uh, two mo most common views uh, within the evangelical tradition, the Reformed view and the Pentecostal view of, of baptism in the Holy Spirit. Uh, in the Reformed view, they uh, have argued, the Reformed view has argued that at conversion, when you give your life to Jesus Christ and you're converted, the Holy Spirit immediately enters into you and you receive all of the Holy Spirit. Uh, your cup is full. And as long as you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, your cup is always full. You can never, you never have less than, a full, than the fullness of the Spirit. In the Pentecostal tradition, they have argued that at conversion, one receives the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, but in a sense, your cup is only partially uh, full. And there's a requirement to continue to push into the Spirit and to have subsequent fillings of the Spirit. Well, which one is right? Well, I, I would suggest to you that both are capturing an important biblical truth, and yet both are, in fact, misunderstanding something about the Christian life in the Spirit. And, and the misunderstanding really comes down to the fact that we are not cups. We are not cups either full or half full. Cups are, are, are fixed. They're rigid, but our souls are not like those cups. Rather, I think the better metaphor that might, that might help us understand the filling of the Spirit is that our souls are more comparable to trees. More comparable, you think of Psalm 1 in this, our souls are more comparable to trees which grow and are dynamic. Did you know that a tree is totally filled or totally saturated with water? And if you cut down a fresh tree and throw the logs in a, even a burning fire, that wood will not burn because it's full of water. Uh, you have to dry out the wood for a long time before it will actually burn. But we, as living trees, 
When we have the Holy Spirit, we're like the tree, which at every stage of its development is saturated with water. Uh, from acorn to sprout to seedling to sapling, all the way into maturity, the, the percent, by percentage-wise, the tree always has the same fullness of the water as the tree begins and continues uh, to grow. And I think that metaphor, rather than the cup, if you think of the tree, helps us understand what it means to be filled by the Holy Spirit. It, it, it acknowledges that indwelling of the Spirit, it begins at conversion. And when you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit completely and totally indwells you. There's no part of you that is not indwelled. In that sense, the Reformed tradition is absolutely correct. But the Holy Spirit, and this is where the Pentecostal tradition, I think, it helps us, the Holy Spirit is never satisfied with filling you as an acorn or as a sapling. He gets in there and he fills you up and he says, this is not enough. You are to become something far greater than what you are. And he begins to push and to urge and he energizes our souls so that we grow. And as we grow, the filling continues to fill. He has filled you, Paul says in Ephesians 3.19, but he aims to fill you with all the fullness of God. And so he sees what you are, but he knows what you will become. And so as he penetrates you, he grows us. So this is what I think it means to be filled by the Spirit. If we were to define it, I would define it this way. It means that each day you yield to the indwelling saturation of the Holy Spirit, so that he expands your capacities, think of the tree, he expands your capacities to ever greater measures of his immeasurable love and fullness. So he wants to fill you up with more holiness. He wants to fill you up with greater guidance so that you have the right path in your life. He wants to fill you up as you eagerly and earnestly seek more gifts with more gifts, more powerful gifts, so that they are used for the equipping of the saints and for the spread of the gospel. We are to be filled by the Spirit. But then, of course, the question is how? How are we filled? Of course, we are to give our lives and yield ourselves over to Jesus Christ. But Paul does make it a, a present tense command to the Christians who are already converted that they are to push into this. So what does that mean? How are we to do this? Well, some say that the filling of the Holy Spirit is demonstrated primarily by extraordinary signs. And I think that's hardly the emphasis of the Apostle Paul, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. But then some have, in a kind of a pendulum swing, have reacted to this emphasis of the need of extraordinary signs, and they've actually become quite skeptical of the extraordinary work of God through his Holy Spirit upon us. And this is actually what happened during the first Great Awakening, in which many of the Boston clergy, as it was taking, out in West, uh, taking place in western Massachusetts, they, they doubted and they were criticizing the revival that was taking place as sheer emotionalism. And as the Awakening's greatest theologian, Jonathan Edwards, he saw, although he was very much part of the frozen chosen of the Reformed tradition, he saw firsthand the remarkable outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in his most famous sermon, The Sinner in the Hands of an Angry God, he was a guest preacher one night at the Congregational Church in Enfield, Connecticut. And it's important to know that Edwards was uh, by no means a, an eloquent speaker. In fact, he was known to read his manuscript uh, in somewhat of a monotone voice. And despite his, uh, his delivery, he could not, at this particular night, he could not even finish the sermon. George Marsden, in a very good book that Tracy and I read a few weeks ago, definitely recommend it, A Short Life of Jonathan Edwards. It's a biography of Edwards, very good. He writes about this particular night when Edwards was delivering this specific sermon, and I'll quote Marsden, quote, the tumult, as he delivered the sermon, the tumult became too great as the audience was overcome by screaming, moanings, and crying out, what shall I do to be saved? Oh, I'm going to hell. Oh, what shall I do for Christ? 
One of the fellow ministers who was there that night, he recorded that the shrieks and cries were piercing and amazing. And a number of souls, he says, were wrought upon the, that night, and oh, the cheerfulness and pleasantness of their countenances as they gave their, the life to Jesus Christ. And even so, the, the, the work of the Spirit at that first great awakening in the 1730s, 40s, and 50s, it ended up changing that entire generation across the 13 colonies. It took the churches that were dead and practicing formal religion, and it shook them to the very core with this extraordinary outpouring of the Spirit. But, doesn't, uh, but the Spirit doesn't just work extraordinarily at Pentecost or in the 1700s. I was asking a congregant, congregant just this week, what does it mean to be filled by the Spirit to you? And she immediately took me to a story when she was 20 years old. She's in her 70s now, I believe. And she took me to when she was 20 years old, there was a gathering in her living room. Her father was a pastor of the local church. And there was this desperate family in the neighborhood uh, who had a son with a terrible drug addiction. And they gathered in her living room, uh, and there was another pastor there who was very experienced in prayer, and he, as he laid his hands on this drug-addicted young man, he began to quietly pray. Uh, and this congregant, who's also here in this room right now, she says that a cloud descended into the living room, and she said the Holy Spirit manifested his presence in a way that she has never seen before or since. Several people, including the family members, fell to the floor. And she was filled, she said, with such an amazing sense of the joy of God that she started jumping up and down. And her mother had to try to stop her because she could not stop jumping into the exhilaration of the beauty and the worship of God, of who he was. Well, I asked, well, okay, good, but what happened to that man who was prayed for? What happened to the addiction? And she said that he was ultimately healed of that addiction, and he went on to live a drug-free and spirit-filled life. Jonathan Edwards, in writing to the skeptical clergy of the revival of his own time, he wrote this, and I love this quote. He said, God is pleased sometimes in dealing forth spiritual blessings to his people, in some respect to exceed the capacity of the vessel in its present scantiness, so that he does not only fill it full, but he makes their cup to run over. And he pours out a blessing sometimes in such a manner and measure that there is not room enough to receive it. O Spirit of God, even so, we pray now that you would come with might and power and beauty and joy. Fill us, fill me, fill us in this church, O oh Lord. Yet, the Holy Spirit's filling is mostly not extraordinary, but it's experienced and encountered through ordinary means and experiences. Ephesians 5, back to Ephesians 5, 18 through 20, it stresses the ordinary environment of the Spirit. And you kind of look at the structure. The primary command is be filled with the Spirit. And then it's followed by these three verses, 19, 20, and 21. And there, in the Greek, there are these three participles that lay out these three expressions of being filled by the Spirit. A praising, verse 19. Thanksgiving, verse 20. And then in verse 21, mutual submission. That's the actual grammatical structure of this text. And I think there's two ways to understand it, and I think they're complementary ways. One is that Paul, in these three things, he's describing the effects of being filled by the Holy Spirit. So that if you lack the effects, then you have to begin to wonder if you lack the cause. In other words, uh, are you cursing or praising? Are you grumbling or are you thanking? Are you controlling, or are you mutually submitting within the family and in the church? 
But I also think that it's not only kind of an analysis of the, of the self that we can do in thinking about these things, but it describes the environment where the spirit filling takes place. And I think this is important to understand. By placing ourselves within these environments and practices, the Holy Spirit, he exercises filling. So in other words, in verse 19, praising. Uh, it's a form of prayer, of singing to God about how much you love him and reflecting and thanking him and how much he loves you. That's essentially what's, what praise and hymns and singing is all about. I know one person who every morning reads scripture and then she praises God in song. I know another physician, he was an anesthesiologist, he lived with us for three years, and he wanted to be known as the praying anesthesiologist. And I can testify that he would come home every night uh, with his wife, and he would get on his guitar every night, and he would praise the Lord with songs that he had written, um, as well as uh, 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 hymns and psalms and songs that we, we all know. Maybe you're not a musician, uh, but you can sing a cappella to, uh, if you have a hymn book or get a hymn book. Or you can, as my mother and I have been doing, we've been listening to YouTube hymns and watching the bouncing ball and singing along uh, to those songs. You can join us for third Friday prayer nights. Every third Friday, we're having prayer and worship nights here in this church. Or of course, you can join us every Sunday, singing from the heart to the Lord. So as you enter into the environment of praise, what happens is the Holy Spirit who is in you, he begins to expand and he wants to push out and he wants to grow you. It's the same thing with thanksgiving in verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to consistently and daily count our blessings and, and name them one by one. We're to practice what some call negative thanksgiving, in which we give thanks to God even for the really hard things. And as you do this, you enter yourself and you bring yourself in this practice in an environment of thanksgiving in the Holy Spirit. He says he's going to grow you as that tree, and he pushes out as you enter into that environment. Or thirdly, he, he talks about mutual submission in verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And this is where we, we prefer other people's desires rather than our own. We listen to one another more than we talk. We think more highly of others above ourselves. And as you enter into that environment of a humble submission, the Spirit pushes out and He grows your spirit. And as He pushes and grows you out, you become more filled. I think finally it's important uh, to consider as we study this specific text, uh, this passage, Ephesians uh, 5, 18 through 20, is in direct parallel with another letter that Paul wrote, Colossians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. If you put these two texts, you look at them side by side, you'll see that they're essentially identical with only one difference. In Ephesians 5, he says, be filled with the Spirit. And at the same place where he's identically writing to the church in Colossae, rather than say, be filled with the Spirit, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And I think the takeaway is that these two statements for Paul have a close or perhaps even identical meaning, which is to say to be filled with the Spirit means that you will be filled with the Word of Christ richly within you. It means that to be filled you'll be reading and studying and memorizing and meditating on Holy Scripture. The, the Spirit always works with Scripture, certainly never in contradiction to it. But it's not just enough to know Scripture's content. It has to dwell in you richly, which means you not just know the ideas or the thoughts, but you apply it and you live it out. Dead religion knows Scripture very well. Satan knows Scripture better than any of us in this room, no doubt. Dead religion knows it well, but fails to richly apply it and to live it out. So let me summarize. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, it means first that we have to empty ourselves of those intoxicating substances and false spirits that are taking up the room within us. We have to get rid of them through confession and through repentance. But it means also that we have to uh, we are, are allowing 
the loving presence of the Holy Spirit to fill you up, think, the, think of the tree, to fill you up with an ever-creasing expression of greater fullness of holiness and of his guidance and of his power in the giving of his gifts. We, we push into them like a tree that is growing. But it, lastly, it means that we will experience that filling once in a while, if God is good, in some extraordinary outpouring upon you or upon a collection of us. Pray that that would be the case. But normally, under most conditions, the Spirit will fill us as we enjoy and participate in the Spirit in these environments of praise and of thanksgiving and of mutual submission and of engagement with Scripture. Well, by the 1730s, when Jonathan Edwards began pastoring in Northampton, Massachusetts, in that congregation, the hearts of the people, they were stone cold. And in fact, most of the churches in the region, the, fire, the fires of the Puritans that had laid down the churches generations before, they were out, or nearly out, in decline. Then in December of 1734, something extraordinary happened in the words of Edwards, the Spirit of God, began extraordinarily to set in. In the town, there were about six people who suddenly and in all in succession were savingly converted one after the other. One of them was a young woman. She was, in fact, uh, Edwards says, the leader of the frolics. And she became completely changed as she met Jesus Christ. And many began to speak to her, asking what was happening, and speaking to the others, and something remarkable took place within that town so that something spiritually shifted, not only in the church, but across the town. And Edward says, the noise of the dry bones waxed louder and louder. That was December 1734. By the summer of 1735, just six months later, the entire town of Northampton was utterly changed spiritually, Edwards records. People could not stop talking about Jesus, about his kingdom, about the blood that was shed. Edwards says that secular work had almost come to a complete stop because the people could not stop talking about the Lord and studying and praying. And Edward stresses that it all began with the young people. It's the young people that are the catalyst. It's the young people that, that is, are necessary for the revival and the awakenings to take place. It began with them, but it did not stop. Uh, Edward says that almost no one would ever come to Christ in a conversion experience in their uh, as a middle-aged person. But during that six-month period of time, 50 people came to Christ who were in their 40s. 20 people came to Christ who were in their 50s. 10 people came to Christ in their 60s. And he says two people in their 70s were converted to Jesus Christ. He says that more than 300 people, 300 souls were, quote, savingly brought home to Christ in this town in the space of half a year, unquote. And it included children and teens. About half were men and half were women. Edward said that God did, was doing, in that six-month period of time, he was doing more in one or two days compared to an, an entire year of ordinary ministry. It was remarkable and extraordinary. You see, the heart of the awakening, that first awakening, it consisted of people having this incredibly deep awareness of their own sin and that they were intoxicated by those cultural spirits and that they had to let go because it was only leading to death. But not only that, it consisted of this extraordinary clarity of the, the meaning and the heart of the gospel, that it's about Christ, it's about his blood, it's about his righteousness, which is given as this gracious free gift just by faith. And people were gripped by this anew and in a fresh way, even though they had heard it many times before. The spirit of overflowing began in Northampton, but it did not end there. 
in the year 1735 and 36. It spread to, first to South Hadley, then to Suffield, to Sunderland, Deerfield, Hatfield, went to West Springfield, to Longmeadow, and then in Enfield, Connecticut, the minister said, more has been done in one week than in the last seven years of ministry combined. Springfield, Hadley, Coventry, Stratford, New Haven, Guilford, Mansfield, Tallinn, Hebron, Bolton, Preston, Woodbury. And that was only the beginning. The power of the Holy Spirit was poured out in some fresh and new way on dead bones, and the church was awakened. And people were coming to him, and it went throughout Massachusetts Bay Colony, and it went down to the other 12 colonies all combined, and then across the Atlantic all the way to England. And of course, the obvious question that I ask is, God, will you do this again? Can these bones live? Oh, Lord, you know. Of course, it's not in our control. We can empty ourselves of those intoxicating spirits, and I invite you to do that even now as I speak. And we can yield. We can yield ourselves over more and more to be filled and filled, growing in the holiness and power of the Holy Spirit. And we can also, we can earnestly pray. We can pray for, for revival with, uh, with all of our hearts. We can pray and we can prophesy. Come, Holy Spirit, fill me. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us. Come, Holy Spirit, fill Boston. Come, Holy Spirit, Fill our nation. Fill this world with your spirit. Come, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. Yes, Lord, this is our prayer. Would you hear it? Would you respond? And would you move? for your glory and our joy. Oh, how we need you to do this afresh on us and on this world, on this city and well beyond. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.